Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in this crazy world. Uh, today is our fourth uh, seminar within our um, Dialogue on Ethology and Behavioral Ecology seminar series, organized by our ethology unit of the Department of Biology at the University of Pisa. Today, I'm very, very happy to be here and to be presenting this seminar because uh, it is uh, offered, it is held by, um, given by Dr. Paolo Domenici, that is a colleague and a friend, and um, he is from uh, the National Research Council, uh, Italian National Research Council, uh, and uh, from the Institute of Biophysics, and uh, he will be talking about predator and prey interactions, in particular, uh, be those between uh, large um, predators uh, in, um, in the sea ecosystem, in the ocean ecosystems, and uh, while preying upon fishes. So it is a pretty, pretty interesting topic. And uh, with me today presenting Paolo, uh, there is uh, Dr. Elena Maggi, that is uh, a member. Good afternoon, Elena. Good afternoon. Uh, she is um, she's a, a senior researcher at, in our department in the marine biology unit, and she is actually the one that introduced Paolo to me something like if, uh, last summer, and uh, we had some fun in Sardinia last summer together, Paolo, and uh, we had a chance to talk about work and wine and uh, and other very nice and happy things to talk about. So now I let Elena introduce Paolo. She knows him better than I do. And um, and then uh, he will uh, start his seminar. So thanks again to everyone for being here and attending our seminar. And Elena, I leave it to you to introduce Paolo. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, a colleague but also an old friend, Dr. Paolo Domenici. Uh, Paolo received a master in biological sciences at the University of Milan, and then received a PhD in zoology at the University of uh, British Columbia on the uh, biomechanics of escape response in fish. Then he moved to Scotland for a first postdoc uh, on schooling behavior in herring, and then a second postdoc in Marseille at the CNRS on the kinematics of walking in crayfish. Uh, he then moved back to, to Italy, <laughs> uh, and uh, in particular in Oristano as a researcher, uh, and uh, again as a researcher uh, at the CNR in Oristano too. He uh, recently moved uh, to Pisa at the um, IBF, at the CNR, and uh, his research interest covers uh, different areas, uh, and in particular, ecophysiology, ecomorphology, biomechanics, animal behavior, conservation physiology, marine biology, and fish biology. Um, among uh, his specific subjects of research. Uh, there are the uh, animal locomotion, anti-predator tactics, uh, predator-prey interactions, animal behavior in relation to environmental variables, and short-range orientation. Um, Paolo published more than 130 publications uh, in top journals such as uh, Journal of Experimental Biology, Ecology Letters, Nature Climate Change, Three Ecological Application, Biology Letters, uh, PNAs, Journal of Fish Biology, Current Biology, Nature. Um, so, what else? <laughs> uh, please, Paolo, uh, I think it's time to start your seminar. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. So, I assume. You can all hear me. And so today I'll be talking about uh, animal locomotion 
and predator-prey interactions. And uh, we'll be looking at attack strategy of large marine predators and attacking small prey. So I will not uh, bore you with a major theoretical background on this, but I will simply go through some very simple uh, ideas in terms of the different phases that are involved in predator-prey interactions and also what the focus of my talk will be, which is uh, admittedly only part of a larger story. So you can see here two green lines that belong to predators and prey. And what happens along these lines, so you look at it sort of chronologically, as you're just hanging out in the sea and at some point you may encounter a predator or a prey, and I'm using the cursor to show you where we are. So this is related, of course, to, for example, relative abundance and distribution. You may encounter a lot of predators if there are a lot of them around, or you may encounter a lot of prey for the same reason. Then encountering doesn't mean that you are actually detecting uh, the prey or the predator as such. So you need to actually have detection, which implies some kind of uh, uh, useful distance so that you can actually enter the game of the encounter. But at the same time, at the next step, you need to make sure that what you see in front of you is a predator or a prey. For example, a prey will recognize a predator because of previous experience. So it's something that may involve memory, for example. At this point, then, if you, once you identify your predator, if you're a prey, you may want to leave the game. As it indicated here, avoidance. Avoidance means you just get in the hell out of there, you know, out of the game. So the predator doesn't even get a chance to attack you. On, on the other hand, if you're a predator, you may start approaching your prey, getting closer to your prey. You're not attacking the prey yet. And that is also related to kinematics and morphology, depending on you know, your size, for example, you may get, you may be able to get closer or not as close and scare the prey before you can even attempt to attack it. And then here's the focus of what we'll be talking about. It's uh, basically what we can call the attack escape sequence. So what happens here, a predator will attack a prey. And so that's the attack that results uh, in potentially an escape attempt by the prey, which if it fails, it means that the prey will be captured. If, on the other hand, it's a success, then perhaps that's the end of the story, or perhaps the predator insists and will actually chase the, the prey and do a second attack. And so this can go on forever, unless perhaps the prey, again, can leave the game by reaching out to cover. And this will also relate to mimicry and crypsis. And of course, you can already tell uh, by uh, some of the uh, factors in here that this is, these are not universal rules. They depend a lot on the structural complexity of your environment. Leaving the game for cover uh, will be much more available in a structurally complex environment, like say coral reefs or certain coastal areas, but it will be much harder to do that in the open sea. So the structural um, uh, of the environment will, will have an effect on which part may be more or less uh, important. Nevertheless, today we'll be focusing on this part, the attack escape sequence, which is certainly fundamental for survival, although in a relative sense, the, its weight may change depending on uh, or which type of system uh, we are. Now I want to show you a video because I, I like to get into the, uh, the game right away without more, much uh, further ado. And I want to show you a video by a friend of mine, John Flank Stephens, who's collaborated with me for a number of projects. And this video was taken by, by John in Australia. And it's basically an attack by a labriform fish within a school of hardy heads. And it's just to show you uh, what we're really talking about when we talk about the uh, strike escape sequence. So you can, you can launch the video now.
Okay, so that was the video and gives you sort of like an idea of the system and how complex it can be. You can just imagine, uh, and I can imagine, uh, what uh, a mess and how complicated it would be to try to uh, uh, keep track, uh, track all the, all the prey in that video as well as what the predator is doing. And certainly there are a lot of, there's a lot of effort in that direction in order to try to understand systems as complex as that. But let me go back just a little bit, a few years also in terms of using a little bit of a reductionist approach for now, just focusing on one single prey in a laboratory environment to show you in a nutshell what an, an escape response consists of. So this is done as cleanly as one can think of. So it's a, it's a dark prey on a white background. It's filmed at 500 frames per second. It will be startled by a um, mechanical, therefore artificial stimulation that will show up on the top right as a, as a symbol. And you will see what it consists of. And then I will explain to you in, in just uh, you know, uh, uh, simplifying what kind of variables we are looking at when we analyze these sort of um, uh, behaviors. So here it is, and it's, it's slowed down. So the, in reality, this happens uh, at a much faster rate. Okay, so that was a classic escape response. And a classic escape response in a fish of this kind, about 15 centimeter long, it's a gray mullet from, uh, which is work done in a lab in Sardinia. It consists of typically two stages. Sometimes it could also be one stage, but typically there are two stages that correspond to these two colors, red and green. And they correspond to uh, two subsequent successive muscular contractions. So there's quite a bit of physiology work done behind this, but I'm not gonna talk about this today. And what this consists of, you can see that during stage one, the fish actually undergo uh, a turn. It, you can see there is like an angle about 45 degrees. And then at, during stage two, there is like a bit of a counter turn. It's a it's a, a contralateral contraction of the opposite side of the musculature. And then the fish tend to glide or even continue swimming. And a lot of the work done in the last, I'd say, 30, if not 40 years, has focused on these two stages. And it's been shown by a number of uh, papers that these are crucial, crucial stages for avoiding uh, being uh, caught by a predator. And the type of variables that we're looking at uh, some are relatively simple are, for example, the velocity and acceleration that one can derive by tracking this dot, which is the center of mass of the fish. And of course, the fish is bigger than just the center of mass, but that's like a proxy of locomotor performance. And you can see right here how speed can go up to, in a, in a fish that small, can go up to two meters per second during stage two. And acceleration is actually quite impressive. Acceleration can go up to 150 meters per second square. So that's a lot more than 10 G, a lot more than the acceleration you would get just due to uh, uh, gravitational force. So this is an impressive acceleration, which is fundamental for avoiding uh, predation. Another important variable to look at is how agile these prey are. And in other, in other words, how fast do they manage to turn? And so you can look here at the turning rate in a instantaneous values, and you can see that during stage one, it reaches something like eight degrees per milliseconds. And, and then because it turns in the opposite direction, then you have negative values about two degrees per millisecond. So basically when you, when you translate that into seconds, you can see that it, it actually turns at an impressive rate of like, uh, 8,000 degrees per second. And that's of course in peak values. But you know, when you translate it in how long it takes for a fish to turn, a fish of this size to turn like 90 degrees, it's a matter of just a few milliseconds, 30, 40 milliseconds and the turn is over. So these are, uh, this is another way to look at these variables. Let's look at the one on the right first turning rate, which is what I just presented. You can also look instead of uh, uh, instantaneous values, you can look at the average value for a given turn. So a given turn is given here by alpha. In this case, it's like 130 degrees. And this 130 degrees turn 
is accomplished in something like 50 milliseconds. So in 50 milliseconds, you, you're done your turn. You change your trajectory, which is pretty impressive. And of course, this is a small fish. And I'll tell you later why I insist on the size idea. Uh, another important variable is the turning radius. So it's how much space does a fish need in order to make a turn. <clears throat> and you can measure that by approximating a circle uh, throughout the path of the center of mass. As you can see here, the center of mass during the beginning of the turn goes along a circle and that circle can be uh, um, estimated and you can take the radius of that circle. It gives you an idea of how much space a fish needs in order to turn. Okay, so now we've given a little bit of an idea of what kind of variables we're looking at, but uh, uh, we'll see whether or not they matter. Uh, so going uh, about the uh, stri strike escape phase of predator-prey encounters, uh, which is fundamental for survival, as I told you earlier, although its relative importance depends on the type of structural complexity of the habitat. In other words, fish may be able to find a hiding place or maybe hiding all the time. Predators may be coming from the open sea or again themselves from a shelter. Clearly, locomotor and sensory performance are the major determinant of success in catching a prey as well as in escaping from a predator if you are a prey. And there is quite a little bit of work on this, but let me just show you a seminal paper from 15 years ago by Walker et al. Uh, in 2005. And they looked at the uh, variables that have a significant effect on whether you're successful in uh, escaping from a predator or not. And four parameters were found to affect evasion outcome. One was the time required to reach the prey by the striking predator, which in other words, is also related to the distance at which the prey escapes from an attacking predator, because that distance it is then translated into a time for reaching the prey in relation to the predator's speed. So timing as well as distances are, are relevant when you want to escape your predator. Of course, the evasion path, so which direction you're going, can also have a major effect. Certainly, if you're a prey, if when you want to escape, you go straight into the predator's mouth, that's not going to do any good to you. Uh, and then uh, third and fourth point are some of the, the main ones that we'll be talking about today. Uh, uh, one is the ability of the prey to generate rapid tangential acceleration, which takes into account basically the distance you cover, the maximum acceleration and the maximum velocity. And what I showed you just a couple of slides ago, the ability of the prey to rapidly rotate during the initial stage of the fast start, which corresponds to turning rate, as we have just seen. Now, uh, a, a major point that I'd like to make, and then we'll see why scaling or if scaling may uh, play a role in this, is the, the main difference between predators and prey is clearly their size. This is particularly true in kalimbalistic interactions when the predator and prey are actually the same species. So they have similar physiological uh, performance, but they're different in size. But uh, uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, predators and prey, other than their size, they may be quite similar in their physiology and uh, locomotor and sensory ability, at least if they are from the same taxon. But let's look at what uh, size uh, effects there are in terms of differences. So here's some work done by Shar Fatal some 17 years ago, and it's just taken as an example. There are many other examples that show something similar. And this is about bluefish uh, uh, as a predator of bay anchovy. So these are predators that attack the prey by going straight in a whole body acceleration towards the prey. You can see here from the graph, as the size of the predator increases, so does the size of the prey. So on average, you get a linear regression of these means. But of course, what is interesting to see is that for any given size of your predator, you have actually a large range of sizes of prey. And what does that mean in terms of predator-prey ratio? We see that in the figure in the panel B. So there is a relatively large spread of prey length to predator ratio. And these basically correspond uh, to having a predator about two to 10 times longer 
than their prey. So within this sort of approximate range, we get this effect of predators attacking prey, uh, at least in this example, by using whole body acceleration. So now this is sort of like the general background that I'm, I'm giving you. And of course, I can think of many exceptions to some of the general patterns that I gave you, but let's keep going in terms of looking at the performance and how this scales that will make us understand and you know come forward with certain hypotheses on how uh, large predators may cope with uh, these uh, scaling patterns. So given that in most cases predators are larger than their prey uh, in these systems, a fundamental question to start with is how does locomotor performance scale? And I'm talking about the locomotor performance that matters in these kind of interactions. So what are the potential implications for the strike escape phase of predator-prey encounters? So again, predators are generally larger than the prey. Does this give them an advantage in terms of locomotion, locomotion performance? As some of you may know, may uh, imagine if you are a large predator, say a dolphin or a tuna or a large fish, you're bound to be faster than your little prey. Now, is that the case from the data that we have? Yes, indeed, it is the case. As you will see, I've actually, I'm using in this talk, going back and forth from fish to cetaceans uh, uh, because sort of a general principle are similar and I'm uh, treating them as, as uh, aquatic vertebrates that swim uh, with a similar pattern. So as you can see here, speed in indeed increases with size and, uh, and that therefore, uh, if you stop here, you may just come to the conclusion that predators would have no problems in, in catching their little prey because they're faster. Now, yes, that is true. That is true if you assume this kind of situation. This is from the Beijing Olympics where uh, we have a, a, we put a goldfish and we told the goldfish to go in a straight line. And then we added a norca whale uh, of course, this is all fake. Uh, and we told the orca whale, don't worry, just go straight. And uh, I can tell you for sure that the orca whale would be able to catch the poor goldfish way before the end of the swim pool. So does that matter? Well, swimming in a straight line indeed would work for a predator to catch the prey, as long as they both keep a straight course. But is that what happens in nature? No. In nature, the prey will have all kinds of opportunities and reasons to turn, to hide, to stop and go, okay? So uh, if you think about it, this is the same in, in, uh, in any other even uh, games that we play. You know, if you're playing soccer or basketball or anything like that, you may be relatively fast, but if you're predictable, uh, the opponent will catch you. So there is some degree that you want to change what you're doing, okay? And this change, for example, is called acceleration. So what about the acceleration abilities? Uh, how do they relate to length? Now, I don't dare running a regression line in something like this cloudy, but certainly there is a trend uh, between fish that are in blue and cetaceans to uh, have a decrease in acceleration. So if that was the case, then if you do a stop and go kind of strategy, then if you're a small fish, you may have an advantage over your large predators. But even more clear is what happens with turning rate. And here again, we have uh, average and maximum values, red and, and blue. And uh, if you go from fish to cetaceans, but even within fish, you have a decrease in turning rate. And this is because the muscle contractions on any given fish will take longer time to occur when you get bigger. So that means that what we were looking at before for you know turning something like 90 degrees, our little fish will take something like 50 milliseconds, whereas our work orca will take something like half a second. So if you are that goldfish escaping from the orca, the best thing for you to do is turn 90 degrees and you'll do that within a few milliseconds, whereas the orca will take much longer. And by the time the orca has turned, you will have had a little bit of uh, slack in order to escape further away. 
Uh, another important variable that I showed you earlier is turning radius. Now here you see the turning radius increases with length and you may go like, oh, okay, so that's, that's the opposite and it's better with length. Well, not really because a large turning radius is a bad thing in terms of, in terms of maneuverability. And here again, you have your fish having a very small turning radio, radius, which means they can turn on a dime, which means they're very maneuverable, whereas cetaceans, and you can see at the top of the scale, orca, we have a very large turning radius. So you can imagine if you're a little fish, you turn on this very little space, and whereas the orca will have to use not only a much longer time to turn, but also a lot more space and would lose track of the prey. Now, incidentally, when you plot this in terms of uh, turning radius measure in length, you see that the values are relatively constant, uh, around 15 to 20% of the body length, with a lot more variability in fish species, probably because of the variability in body shape, where you go up from relatively uh, rigid animals such as tuna, with a turning radius around 40% of the body, and very flexible fish such as angelfish, with a very small turning radius. But nevertheless, what is important here is that, yes, you do keep a relatively constant turning radius depending on your size, but if you're big, this means turning radius will be huge. And that's a disadvantage if you're a predator. So basically prey can be highly maneuverable, as we can see from this data, with high acceleration, high turning rate, and tight turning radius, and therefore elusive. And we do know that predators have higher speed, but their higher speed may not compensate for the lower maneuverability when compared to the prey. So the question is therefore, how do large predators manage to feed on smaller and elusive prey? Because we do know that they manage that. And we go back many years to uh, a theory by one of the founders of the field of predator-prey interactions and locomotion, which is Paul Webb, and I actually quote some of the things he wrote. Uh, I had less written, but I realized in this morning that he said a lot of very wise things, so I, I wrote more uh, just before the talk. So as they increase in size, aquatic vertebrates use various means to ensure that prey are less maneuverable than they are. These uh, means include, for example, consumption of increasing smaller prey relatively to predator body size. So what this means is that okay, you have a disadvantage, but what if you actually catch smaller and smaller and smaller prey? Then you actually culminate in doing something like we can call filter feeding. So the prey is, yes, very elusive, but in fact, it's so small that this elusiveness may not matter anymore compared to the huge mouth of the predator, as we shall see. Large aquatic vertebrates further reduce the discrepancy between prey and predator maneuverability by concentrating disturbing or disorienting prey. And this, there's often a cooperative or perhaps not cooperative, but anyways, activity of predator groups. And I won't talk too much about this, but it's been part of my uh, research uh, programs. And then finally, and this is something we'll talk about more today, prey may disturb and disorient naturally schooling or concentrated prey for easier capture by what Paul Webb calls thrashing about among the prey and taking stun and injure individuals. We, I, I call them the use of uh, weapons, as we shall see. Let's try to look at this sort of uh, very interesting idea, which was stimulating for my research, uh, with a very simple uh, diagram. Here you see on the y-axis with you know no numbers, but it's just indicative, how prey relative elusiveness uh, re between, you know, relative to the predator would increase as you have an increase in predator-prey ratio, okay? So you get to, you, have, you follow this line of increase as you get to, say, uh, a prey that is even larger than you to a prey is the same size as you to a prey that is 10 times smaller than you are. Within this range, we know that whole body attacks are common. As uh, Paul Webb was saying, once you get to a tiny, tiny prey, then you're talking about filter feeding when the prey is a hundred or even a thousand times smaller than you are. And it's the something in between that is not so clear. But let's look at filter feeding just for a minute. So you can look at a, you know, again, a very simple cartoon diagram of a prey that is uh, quite maneuverable and can get out of its larger predator with this very complex 
uh, maneuver. But you could also imagine an even larger uh, predator, such as a whale shark, and with the same kind of maneuver, yes, it's a, a lot of uh, uh, complex maneuverability, but what you, where you end up going, you're still within the uh, um, large size of the predator's mouth. So you have not actually gotten anywhere. And therefore, filter feeding may be a way to eliminate the problem of the higher maneuverability in the prey, because at this point and at this size difference, it becomes arguably irrelevant. The question is what happens in between? What happens when you have a range where whole body attacks will not be as easy anymore because the prey is getting more and more maneuverable, but we're still not talking about filter feeding because the prey is not so small that its maneuverability is irrelevant. And this is basically what we'll be talking about today. So here's just a, a general graph where I took a bunch of values from the literature, and there, this is in no way meant to be comprehensive, but I look in the literature for whole body attacks and filter feeding, and you can see here predator length and prey length, and the lines correspond to predator 100 times larger or 10 times larger, these two lines. And you can see that a lot of whole body attacks in green occur with a predator-prey uh, ratio that is less than 10, and filter feeding occurs when the predator-prey length ratio is higher than 100. But then you have a few examples of the use of weapon that occur when predator is larger than 10 times their prey. So it's in line with what Paul Webb had predicted, where beyond a certain range, there is something that doesn't work with your just a very simple whole body attack. You have to use something special. And that something special in some of these predators I'll show you is the use of weapons. You can look at this also by, by doing all kinds of different combinations of predators and prey. Here is whole body attacks with the predator 10 times larger than the prey. Here's filter feeding. Well, of course, this is not in scale, but it's a tiny little prey. All you do is just filter feeding. It doesn't matter if they're elusive. They're not elusive to you because of your large mouth. But then you get to this uncomfortable ratio, if you will, where you seem to be using what I will show you, group hunting as well as weapons. And then with all the other different combinations, for example, here, if the predator is, is actually even larger than you, you may need some companions in order to be able to attack it. And this is like you know killer whales attacking baleen whales as they do in groups, for example. So you can look at all kinds of different combinations and come up with a potential strategy the predators uh, would use in order to be successful. And these are the examples that I'll show you today, the, the two on the left. I was not involved in the one on the right, but I'll, I'll just tell you what it is. So uh, here we'll be talking about killer whales uh, attacking herring uh, using tail slaps, and then uh, uh, sailfish attacking sardines and other species using their bills. And here is work by Oliver et al. from seven years ago, which uh, was on thresher shark uh, attacking the prey by using their tails, slashing with their tails. Okay, so uh, let's zoom on to the actual work we did on killer whales. This is work that started 20 years ago, but I've actually resumed very recently. So I'll show you some preliminary observation from work that I'm doing right at this moment. So the work was conducted in collaboration with uh, uh, TU Simula up in Northern Norway. It was uh, actually very interesting field work because it had to be done in the winter. So winter in Northern Norway is minus 20 degrees. It was uh, sometimes a lot of fun, sometimes a lot of cold. And, uh, and so what we did is that we were, for example, on these uh, um, rubber boats and would be, for example, three of us would have one person in the front holding a stick with a camera, one person in the center looking at the screen to see whether you should be looking more left or right, and one person was driving the boat. And of course, we were at the same time surrounded by killer whales, which are as close to us as a man body length. I can tell you it wasn't scary at the time, but it was scary as an afterthought. So let me just uh, uh, show you this video, but before the video starts, because I can't talk to you in the video, it's just to show you, it's a very old, very old video, so very uh, low quality. 
but it's a first uh, observation of these tail slab behavior, you will see a killer whale going towards a school of herring, and you will actually hear a sound as the killer whale is slapping the herring. And then I'll explain more about it. So the, 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 the video can go now. There you go. So that was the uh, uh, tail slapping behavior, which we analyzed. And, and Tiu and, and Fernando Garte did some work prior to that, where they describe the kind of uh, behavior which uh, involves what they call carousel uh, feeding. So basically, the killer whales surround this group of herring. And as you know, herring may actually be uh, quite far at depth. So they seem to find a way to lift it up to the surface so they're stuck against the surface. So at least there is no way to escape from that perspective going upwards. And then they surround it from all sides and even from below. And after having surrounded them for a while, then they start going in and slapping them. And by using the slaps, they stun a bunch of herring and then there is no escape performance anymore. There is no elusibility, there is no maneuverability anymore because they're basically stunned or even dead and very easy to catch at that point. So we did some kinematic analysis of this. I will not go into the details, but this is what the midline of a killer whale looks like. So you see a tail slap takes about a second to occur. And we, we looked at various segments of the killer whale. I won't dwell into the details. We basically be talking about what happens at the flukes. So here you have the uh, uh, laminar side of the flux that goes through sort of like an S shape. So there's like a preparation phase and then a slap phase. And it's in this area where somewhere between where it says 0.6 and 0.8 and a little further, uh, which is the highest speed of the tail. That's exactly when the uh, herring are being hit. Uh, of course, we also made some kind of calculation of the volume affected the, the volume of water affected by the tail slap. And we know because we estimated the density of the school. So by using the density of the school and the volume of water affected, we managed to estimate how many herring could actually be physically hit. And the number comes out to be about 33. Uh, and that's a pretty high number. That's a lot of herring in just one go compared to how many herring a killer whale would be able to catch with just their mouth. So it's worthwhile using this system. Now, let me just show you some of the variables that we looked at. We looked at angular velocity of the tail. We looked at the velocity of the tail. So the tail goes up to a, a speed of uh, 50, almost 15 meters per second, as well as acceleration. The acceleration goes up to about 50 meters per second. And then we looked at angle of attack and VI, which is an instantaneous measure of volume in order to calculate the volume of water affected. And here we looked also at the sound, and you can see here, the sound in correspondence to uh, the arrows, which is where the tail slap occurs. And we found that um, uh, when we could see the herring being hit, then there was a sound in correspondence to it, which indicates some physical contact, uh, therefore uh, injuring the herring. Now let's look at some variables of performance and also uh, in relation to what the herring can do. Now the gray area is the what what speeds are available to a herring. So the herring can go as fast as a little over two meters per second. And these are the lunging speeds of the whales. So the, the, the speed that the whales uh, do as they're going inside the school. And only in a few cases, they go at a speed that is slightly faster than the herring. But sometimes they don't even do that. And so we never actually saw lunging uh, uh, as related to a behavior that was for catching a fish. Lunging was just a way to enter the school uh, after which the tail slap occurred. And the red line is, and the red points are the uh, tail slap speed. And you can see that that's much faster than a whale does in these situations. It goes up to about 12 to 13 uh, meters per second. And incidentally, that is very close to that green point, which is a very old data by Munson and Harder. Uh, on uh, the uh, maximum speed of killer whales that has ever been recorded. Now, uh, one may say, okay, so, well, they don't, their tail slap don't go much faster than a killer whale can do. 
Yes, that's true. But that uh, data by Johansson and Harder, first of all, was done when a killer whale was doing bow riding. So it was in actually in front of a boat. So taking advantage of the wave of the boat. And secondly, it may have taken very likely quite a few seconds to get to that speed. Whereas for a tail slap, that speed is reached within less than one second. And in fact, what matters is the acceleration. And you can see here, the acceleration of the tail slap in green is higher than what an orca can do with the whole body acceleration. It is actually comparable to the acceleration that fish can do with their own body. Uh, so uh, basically, um, uh, by using a tail slap, killer whales manage to have a much higher performance that they can do with using whole body attacks. And then I wanna show you just some preliminary observation uh, using drones of some very interesting behavior that we found uh, in recent years. And, uh, you know, this is not something that occurs every year. This is just uh, opportunistic observations. And killer whales just come up with ideas as their prey go in different places. So what we found is that in this particular year or a couple of years, herring were found in very shallow water, probably pushed by the killer whales. And these shallow waters were sometimes less than 10 or five meters. And so a killer whale will have a hard time doing a regular tail slap like the one I showed you. So what do they do? We observe this with drones and this is what they do. They actually uh, uh, turn sideways, as you can see in these two pairs of whales. And so you have a whale that is turned sideways and you have a companion that is also turned sideways and they swim within a school so you can see what it uh, biologists often call vacuole, so within a school, and there is a corridor created of prey between the two of them, and then they will make a slap horizontally so they will not hit the ground because, as I said, the ground is shallower than the length of a whale. So if a whale was to do a vertical tail slap here, it would actually damage itself, whereas by doing it horizontally, it has both the advantage of not damaging itself, but also catching the prey that is channeled by one of the helpers. And so we actually found that there is some uh, much more obvious collaboration, which occurs a little bit like this. So you have a striker and you have a helper and you have this prey being channeled. And then at some point, the striker will make a tail slap and the helper is right there, uh, a little bit like a wall, uh, preventing the prey from escaping in the opposite direction. And then the striker will turn back around and they will both feed on the patch of herring that has been hit. And interestingly, and again, this is very preliminary, but we've also noticed a little bit of a division of labor. So there are whales that prefer to be strikers and whales that prefer to be helper and something that we are analyzing actually right now. I should be doing that instead of giving the talk, but that's okay. Uh, so by using a weapon, the tail, killer whales manage to achieve a much higher performance than during whole body attacks. And in addition, they can injure up to 30 school and prey with each tail slap. And so that's the story for the killer whales. So let's go on to another example of using weapons. And this is a more recent example, something I've been doing from 2012 to 2017 or 18. And we're actually continuing this work uh, uh, working actually shifting uh, on uh, white marlin and other species. Uh, so this is work on sailfish. This is what a sailfish looks like. I don't think they come into the Mediterranean, so that's too bad. We had to go to Mexico to work on them. And uh, as this work I did in collaboration with uh, Jens Krause's group from Berlin. And so uh, these guys are also uh, about 10 to 15 times longer than their prey. And uh, the background for this work is about questions about the use of the bill. This is kind of like our first interest. We've known for years and people have speculated about various functions of the bill. Could be foraging, so slashing for, of prey, as well as hydrodynamic benefits. So it may actually decrease the drag on a swimming fish. However, until now, meaning 2012 when we did it, no study had directly investigated the specific mechanism by which billfishes and sailfish in particular use their bill to feed on prey. 
I mean, it was a bit anecdotal, has been observed before, but not analyzed specifically. And the question also was, does the bill help in compensating the potential disadvantage of being a large predator when attacking small elusive prey? So we aim at answering these questions. What is the swimming behavior and speed of sailfish? And uh, those of you who are into fish, you may have heard, and you can actually still find this uh, online, that sailfisher claim to be extremely fast, as fast as 30 meters per second. And, and this claim is actually based on very old work done in 1941. And so uh, there were some doubts about these measures, even if it's often reported, even in, in regular papers. So we wanted to see whether this speed is real. And how is the bill used to feed on school and prey? And what may be the advantages of using a bill for feeding? So I was telling you about Mexico. This is what we did for a number of years in a row. We went to Cancun, and then in Cancun, we hired a boat, and every day, five or six in the morning, we took the boat, and then we went many miles offshore, somewhere between Cancun and, and Cuba, to look for sailfish. And the way this was done was by uh, looking for bird aggregations, because the sailfish, again, are working on the surface. So we looked for bird aggregations, and then when we found them, uh, some of us would go in the water with uh, cameras of various kinds and uh, and then basically try to be around the uh, feeding frenzy, try not to be uh, intrusive, and then took all kinds of shots uh, with high-speed cameras and all kinds of cameras. And we did a series of uh, papers on this, and I will talk only mainly about one and about a couple of, of other ones. Something also that I, I need to mention is that uh, although I will not uh, discuss this very much in this talk, is that sailfish, like killer whales, hunt in groups. And based on our video footage, we estimated the number of sailfish involved in the attacks on sardine prey schools to be between 6 and 40, as you can see here in this cover of, of uh, Phil Trans. And the size of the school, of course, was in some cases very big, even larger than 1,000. And sometimes it was smaller, but it could have been small because by the time it got there, most of them had been eaten. So group, uh, group uh, hunting is a very relevant uh, part of the whole story, but not a part that I have time to discuss in detail right now. So what we did is that uh, we went into the water and we looked at a bunch of different things. We looked also at the swimming behavior of the sailfish. We managed to determine the tail bit frequency using high speed video as well as accelerometry, so in one particular year we went there and we actually fished the sailfish and we equipped them with accelerometer and then we released them in the water to see if undisturbed by if any of us what kind of uh, frequency uh, they got which can be then easily related to their uh, speed. So this is what we found in terms of uh, their tail bit frequency. So one value is for cruising when we saw the sailfish coming by but not, not attacking anything, it was just cruising along. I had this uh, two hertz of tail bit frequency, whereas when it was bursting, it was about six. And this value can be used by people who do fish biomechanics. It's a very common equation. You just uh, estimate your swimming speed by multiplying the length of your fish by the stride length, which is how much, uh, uh, how, how much of a distance can you do with one uh, tail beat. And you multiply that by the tail bit frequency. And uh, in other words, this is a way to estimate uh, um, with uh, relatively high precision swimming speed. And so what we, what we found is that they can swim about two uh, meters per second when they're cruising, which is not surprising. But when they burst, they only swim uh, as fast as eight meters per second. So that seems to be much less than the claim 30 meters per second. So perhaps we're just not lucky. So we tried something else. And one something else is the use of accelerometer, or by the way, let me show you what the sardines can do. The sardines can go only up to about uh, 10 or so, uh, one or so meters per second. So uh, burst is still faster than, than the ability of the sardine. But then of course, as we know, there's issues of maneuverability and acceleration as we shall see later. Now using accelerometry, we found two peaks in line with the cruising and bursting speeds. So this uh, uh, high peak 
is related to fish that are actually cruising. And this lower peak is related to fish that are actually accelerating. So when we compare to our video work, they're actually very similar. We have accelerometry and video analysis that give us steady swimming, which means cruising, similar speeds, and burst swimming. Accelerometry is even a little lower than what we found in video analysis. But both of them are way lower than the claim speed of 30 meters per second by sailfish. So again, we thought, well, okay, so maybe we're just not lucky. Let's use a physiological proxy to derive the maximum ever possible swimming speed that sailfish can do. So we went there again one more year to again fish sailfish and this time uh, we measure their muscle contraction time, which is the minimum muscle contraction time can used again to be derived uh, for the time for each tail beat frequency. Okay. Uh, okay. So no, before I get into that, let me show you how acceleration compares. So the acceleration we found with accelerometry in sailfish is way lower than anything the prey can do. So sailfish would be at a disadvantage in catching a prey with such an, uh, an acceleration. But let's talk about speed again. Perhaps sailfish can swim very fast, but we simply did not observe such behaviors. So we, like I said, we looked at the contraction time of their muscle. While we were at it, we caught a bunch of other fish, Barracuda, Little Tuni, and Dorado. And there is a, an increase through the length of the fish. We use the uh, appropriate values. And here is what matters. We derive how speed relates to the length of the animals. And the values for sailfish are these ones in uh, triangles. And as you can see, the maximum values is, again, 10 meters per second. So our estimate from the field that is around 10 meters per second is realistic. Maybe it's a little lower, but it's realistic of what uh, these fish may be able to do at their best. So the burst speed of sailfish is not particularly high. It's less than 10 meters per second and much lower than previous estimates at 30 meters per second that are probably overestimates. But most importantly, their acceleration using their body is much lower than that expected in the small prey. So again, we're still left with this question. Here we have a predator that is not so fast, it's faster than the prey, but most importantly, the prey will be elusive and will have much higher acceleration than the predator. How does the sailfish manage to catch the prey? And so here, is the, uh, here are a couple of videos that I'll uh, show you. And in these videos, you will see a couple of ways that uh, the uh, uh, predators can catch the fish. So the, the, the videos can start. So you can have different phases here, approaching, and then getting into the school with the bill. And then magically, you end up with uh, a prey uh, uh, being caught. But if you want to see it uh, more specifically and slower and see what happens uh, with the use of the bill, we looked at uh, specifically what we call slashing, which is a rapid lateral movement of the bill through a large section of the school. So what happens, this is decelerated 10 times, is that the bill, the, uh, bill is inserted into a school and the, the sailfish in the school swim for a few seconds and then together basically with the bill inside the school and then at some point the sailfish makes a, a rapid rotation of the bill slashing through the school and we can see that in the video. There you go. So you could see that basically a number of fish were being injured and slashed and what happens here when you look at it for you know closely and biomechanically we actually monitored and, and, and digitized three points on the head of the sailfish. We can call that the tip, the head, the tip of the snout, and the tip of the bill. And of course, goes without saying that by doing some contraction uh, of the body and the head rotating, the points that are further away from the head will move much faster. Much just like if you think of a tennis player um, uh, with a racket, the tip of the racket will go really fast and if you're tall, even faster, because you have a particular rotation, but as you're far away uh, from this uh, 
a fulcrum, the rotation, the point of the rotation will actually go really fast. And this is what we found the, in the three different points. You have the point A, which is at the head that goes at about two meters per second. The tip, the tip of the snout will be three uh, meters per second, but the tip of the bill will go as fast as six meters per second. And so basically slashing is performed with a translational trans, uh, speed at the tip of the bill that is 3.0 times faster than the maximum speed estimated for a sardine. But it, what is interesting is that we compare to a number of different species and the uh, uh, contraction uh, that the sailfish does in order to rotate their head is not any different from what you expect from a fish of that size. So the, the rotational performance lies within expectation for a fish that is a potential model without bill extension. The interesting thing is by having this bill and extension, the tip of the bill will go really fast. And what matters is not just how fast it goes because the tip of the bill, as we remember from the values, goes more or less at the same speed as what a bursting uh, sailfish can do. But how long it takes is what matters. So the tip of the bill reaches its maximum speed in about 52 milliseconds. So with a very impressive acceleration. Here you have the bill slash in motion at the different points along the bill. You see the tip of the bill going about six meter per second and the acceleration going at an impressive value of 120 meters per second square. And now we're comparing with uh, both accelerometry as well as what the prey would be able to do. Here you can see that the whole body motion of a sailfish is comparable to what the tip of the bill does. But the tip of the bill reaches that speed in only 50 milliseconds. And that's because it has very high acceleration. You look at the, the bottom graph, you can see the tip of the bill having an acceleration that is way higher than that of the sailfish itself. And the, the values are comparable to the highest values of various species when they were investigated in the lab, various small uh, prey. So basically they managed to uh, uh, achieve an acceleration that is comparable to that of their prey. And you can see that in this next graph. And so their acceleration is even more impressive than that of, than that of the orca's tail slap. So here's a, a different values of sailfish, bill slashes, and the acceleration is as fast as anything ever recorded in small fish acceleration. Uh, so there's, that's about performance, but there are some other characteristics that I want to mention about the use of the bill, which we found and they were unexpected and very interesting. As I told you earlier, the bill is inserted in the school and it stays there for a while. And, and only a few, after a few seconds, do the uh, sailfish make their slash. So we actually investigated what happens when the bill is inside the school in fish in the area near the bill or far away from the bill. And here is tail bit frequency, which is a proxy for speed, as well as any overtaking, which is a proxy of like some kind of reaction. And you can see here, when you look at target fish, that is fish near the bill, as well as control fish, which is fish in the school far away from the bill, and they have similar tail bit frequencies uh, before the bill contact and even at bill contact. The uh, speed of the target fish increases only after the slash has occurred. So basically what happens is that apparently this bill is so small and so unintrusive that fish don't mind having it in there. They probably not much aware of it neither hydrodynamically nor visually, and, uh, and, and they only react only after the slash occurs. So there is something a little bit magical about the non-intrusiveness of the bill that we're still investigating, but it's really interesting that uh, sailfish manage to do this without disturbing the uh, prey, uh, not until they actually make their slash, which is one of the reasons why it's so effective. And something else that we were interested in, uh, and you, some of you may have seen in documentaries, is that the sailfish has this particular 
uh, feature, which is the sale. And it's not always up the sale. We found that in some cases, especially when the fish were cruising along, the sale, fish, the sale was down. And here we measure uh, in this cruising situation uh, far from the prey, we measure in, in uh, gray the uh, tail bit angle and in black is the, uh, the bill. Uh, amplitude in angle and you can see that you know they have a similar frequencies but the interesting part is that they both oscillate at you know particular range of angles but what happens when the tail is, the sail is up when the fish the the predator is nearing their their prey and sometimes with the uh, bill inside the school what happens is the fish the the sailfish is still swimming as you can see from the gray line uh, going up and down but suddenly the uh, uh, motion of the bill is uh, 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 much smaller. It's, 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 it's almost nothing. You can see that there is minimal oscillation. And this minimal oscillation is likely due to the dampening effect uh, counteracting this force going left and right because of the sail. And the reason why this could be is so that by having very... Uh, minimal motion of the bill, you don't disturb your prey. So that could be one of the functions of the sail. You have the sail up, which minimizing the wiggling motion of the bill when the bill is inside the school and you don't disturb the prey before it's time for slashing. And uh, we also looked at some other characteristics of the bill, which is uh, looking at uh, denticles that we found on the bills. And these denticles create an abrasive uh, surface that actually uh, are uh, used for damaging and injuring the prey during slashing. And then one last part about this uh, sailfish, and I see already been an hour, so I'll try to cut it short, is we looked at laterality. So what we found is that a sailfish can slash their prey left to right or right to left. And we asked ourselves, now is this random? And do the, every individual do it left and right uh, an equal number of times? And the answer is no. If you look at any individual, uh, uh, this is the expectation in yellow if it was random uh, with a simulation, and this is the reality. Uh, sailfish tend to prefer to slash the prey either left to right or right to left. This actually uh, makes them incur into some uh, asymmetrical damage that we found in the bills. But uh, the interesting thing is when you look at capture success, when you look at the laterality index and capture success, the more lateralized you are, the better you are capturing. And you can see here in the bar graph, uh, when you use your preferred side, you're actually better at capturing than if you use your unpreferred side, which is like if you play tennis, if for some reason you injure your right arm and you're right-handed, some days you have to play with your left hand, you're not gonna be as good. So in some cases, sailfish may find themselves having to slash on the wrong side. They still do it, even if they're less effective. Now, this raises another question. If they're lateralized, you can also imagine that a prey, a group of prey that is being attacked, would eventually learn that once the sailfish are going to attack, they will always slash in one direction, and they may become predictable. So are sailfish predictable? Well, they're not, because they actually hunt in groups, and these groups are mixed of left and right-handed individuals. So we calculated how the group laterality uh, uh, changes uh, according to group size. And you can see that it's relatively high if you only have one sailfish. But as you go uh, up to 10 or 15 sailfish, then the laterality becomes so small that basically the group uh, direction becomes unpredictable. So to conclude on this part, by using a weapon, the tail, or the bill, killer whales and sailfish manage to achieve a much higher performance than during whole body attacks. And I want to move on to the last subject of my talk, which is about humpback whales. Now, humpback whales, it's a little bit of a different story. There is less of a weapon involved, although to some extent a little bit, um, but it's more about how to sneak up on your prey. Um, and here is a work that I did in collaboration with Jeremy Goldbogen and others at Hopkins Marine Station, Stanford University. So 
uh, about the uh, uh, humpback whales, they're 15 times longer than the prey, the prey being anchovies, which are very elusive and maneuverable, but also they prey on krill. And there's something interesting about the difference, the uh, different strategies to use when attacking krill and anchovies. And I'll show you a little bit of that. Uh, let me go through the approach that we use. We use um, uh, a, a particular uh, a suction cup that includes cameras. So the videos that I'll show you will have cameras that look back and in the back and in the front. So one camera will look at the tail of the whale and one camera, the most important one for this talk, will look at the front, therefore at the mouth. And accelerometer, magnetometer, etc., that helped us uh, derive the speed of the humpback whale during the attack. And then what we did is we applied the camera. This was also very exciting. Uh, with a pole, with a suction cup, it was not always successful, but it was fun to do. And uh, so now we can go on with uh, video four. It will show lunges towards krill and anchovies. So when there is a krill, so look at the left part, the, there is a mouth opening and the krill basically doesn't do much of a response. Whereas when you're attacking a school, there you open the mouth and the school seems to respond to the opening of the mouth. Now you see another whale attacking in the, in the background here uh, compared to the one with the camera. And then the uh, uh, next video shows that sometimes the, the large flippers of the humpback whale are used uh, by uh, pulling them in the front and directing the prey towards the mouth. So here the video that, that can go will show the, the flippers uh, potentially redirecting the prey towards the mouth. You look at the left side, you can see a flipper coming up and sort of redirecting the prey. And, uh, and then you can see the view from the same whale of others feeding. So you see another whale now open in the mouth, right there. And then you can see the school actually maintain cohesion if the whale is moving, but not open in the mouth. So you see there's not much of a reaction of the school if the whale doesn't open the mouth. And you can see here again, it goes through the school, it's like almost nothing happens and the whale is going passing by, okay? So that's a very important point. So we wanted to look at this particular strategy from the perspective of an anchovy. So now we're thinking I am an anchovy and a huge uh, humpback whale is coming towards me. And what do I see? And so we model the uh, huge humpback whale in a very simplistic way as if it was a circle. And this actually approximate not uh, uh, to, to a large extent, the profile of a whale coming towards me. And so here we use the whale speed profile. So the real whale speed profile from field data to simulate what a, an approaching whale would look like to an anchovy. So here you have the whale coming towards the anchovy. And there you go. And at some point, we actually implemented in the model the fact that not only the circle will get bigger as the whale is getting closer, but also as you open the mouth, the circle will expand even more. And so here are the circles that we did. And we use that as a simulation. And so we needed the anchovies to respond to our uh, stimulation. So this is what we did. Just before the video goes, I need to say a couple of words. So we basically had different programs with uh, uh, the different kind of expansion rates of this dot that symbolizes the whale. And we had a you know constant speed, but also we had the speed that basically simulates exactly the whale coming, as well as the expansion that is related to the opening of the jaw. And on the bottom side of the graph, you will see that at some point, as the circle reaches us, uh, we'll see an escape response by the anchovy. Okay, now the video can go. Okay, so now we basically managed to calculate the derivative of the angle over time at which the anchovy escapes. 
So we could calculate that as simply d alpha dt, at which experimentally we see a response in the anchovy as the whale is coming towards it. So we have experimental values for that. And at the same time, we have field values for what the whales do. So if you follow here the curve, you see the speed of a whale. This is one single example. The speed of a whale coming up to a point uh, with a speed of like four meters per second. And then in the blue line, you can see that it opens the mouth. You have maximum gape. And then it starts closing the mouth and slowing down as it, uh, it closes the mouth onto the prey. So this is also an important graph that shows, again, a similar speed in blue, the distance that decreases, the distance between the predator and the prey. But what is very interesting here is what happens to the alpha dt. The alpha dt as the looming, uh, uh, apparent looming angle onto the prey's retina increases slowly up to a point, And then you have a sudden very sharp increase which is related to the moment when the killer the humpback whale opens the mouth so you can you can actually see it again here's the same uh, kind of pattern you see the simulation uh, uh, and compared to the actual view of a real whale and you can see in correspondence to this opening of the mouth in phase 3i that you have a sharp increase in the alpha dt and that's exactly when you have the escape response in the anchovy very interestingly, what we found is that we had experimental uh, thresholds. You can see the mean here in the center and also minimum and maximum values with the red dots. And this whole range is actually outside the range of the D alpha DT that would be uh, caused by the observed approach speeds of the whale. In other words, the, the whales are approaching at a speed that is always lower than the uh, threshold that would trigger a response in the anchovy. And that is why when, we, th when the whale doesn't open the mouth, the anchovies didn't do any response in the field. Of course, they will respond as soon as the whale opens the mouth. But therefore, a good strategy would be to open the mouth at the very last minute. So we try to model this, and just I'll show you some of the details. Here's the the uh, humpback whale coming. Here's the, the sort of volume that will be affected by the attack. And here's a prey. And we made the prey escape in, in you know, what we know, the kind of directions that prey would take. And we simulated this. And we also simulated the, the kind of density of school and trying to figure out what, what would happen in reality. So bear with me. This is a bit complicated, but it's the last, last slide. So we have the observed speed that I showed you before and the minimum, mean, and maximum value. So the observed speed are all below. And therefore, they would not trigger a response in the anchovy unless the mouth is open. So you can see here reaction distance. And you can see in the bottom the kind of reaction distance that we get uh, uh, with uh, mouth being open and the speeds that are being used. And of course, any reaction distance that we get, which is related to the values we found experimentally, that distance can correspond to time because we know the speed of the whale, we know the potential speed of the prey. So then we know how much of an escape time the prey would have based on the distance between prey and the predator. And then we put everything into this simple geometrical model and we can actually calculate what proportion of the school can be caught uh, once the mouth is being open. And you can see here in the bottom curve, it goes up to about 30%, but it actually increases a lot once you use the flipper that uh, stop the uh, uh, anchovies from escaping outside a certain range. So what we found is anchovies do not respond to a virtually approaching whale at all un unless or until the opening jaws rapidly amplify the apparent size of the whale, at which point, however, engulfment has already begun and a substantial portion of fish in the school would have no time to escape, especially if you add also the uh, 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 flipper use. And when you compare to krill feeding, it was this work done by, by Jeremy and, and David uh, bef before I went there. But what, what they found is very interesting that uh, in krill, uh, krill feeding, the pattern of the speed and gape and all those variables is much more standardized. So you have mouth opening exactly, 
at the maximum speed and very little variability between different uh, ev events being recorded in different whales. But it's a little bit more of a mess when they're attacking anchovies. You see that mouth opening occurs at all kinds of different times and speed varies a lot more. What we think is that basically krill feeding, krill do not seem to respond. So they can have an optimal way of attacking and more standard way of attacking that minimizing minimizes the effort whereas uh, and, and, and the drag and all the other physical component. Whereas when you're attacking anchovy, the main goal is to get as close as possible to the school and open the mouth at the last moment. And, and it, this in relation to the speed uh, 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 basically causes a very high variability of, of when the mouth open in correspondence to the top speed. So when you're comparing creel feeding and anchovy feeding, in the, in the speed profile and where the mouth opening occurs. In krill feeding hotback whales, prey escape, as we know, is minimal. There is practically no reaction. And therefore, these whales adopt the most hydrodynamically efficient engulfment profiles, with mouth opening coincides with maximum speed. In contrast, anchovy feeding hotback whales make fine scale adjustment of attack speed to facilitate the onset of mouth opening, not in relation to speed, but in relation to where they are relative to the prey. So that mouth opening occurs as close as possible to the prey. So in conclusion, large predators that are about 10 to 50 times longer than the prey, often use a number of strategies, which is illustrated in this talk using tails, bills, and even flippers in the case of humpback whales to improve their success in catching elusive and highly maneuverable prey. And in addition, in the case of humpback whales, they approach the prey at a speed that does not trigger any visual response. And only at the last moment do they open their mouth and extend the flipper. At this point, anchovies may react because we know that from the experiments in the lab, but then it's too late for them to manage to escape because the predator is very close to them. And final conclusion is that consideration based on both locomotor and sensory performance, as we saw from the anchovy case, can provide major insights into the feeding strategies of large marine predators. Also, predator-prey size ratio may affect the hunting strategies of marine vertebrates by the using of weapon, the use of group hunting, and certainly, we need more field work using what is now available as new technologies, modern cameras, drones, biologging tags, which will be fundamental to understand the basis of the feeding behaviors of large money and predators in the open ocean. And with this, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Tio Simula, Yves Jourdain for killer whale work, for the selfish work, Jens Krause and his group, John Stephenson, Teddy Herbert Reed, and Stefan Omaras, and for the humpback whale work, Jeremy Goldbogen's uh, group uh, at Hopkins, as well as Jean Potvin and St. Louis University. Thank you for your attention. Thanks to you, uh, Paolo, for the- I was a little over time. <laughs> don't worry about that, don't worry, don't worry about that. That is fine. Uh, as, I meant, as I told you, it's better to have, to, to keep, your, keep the time that is needed to, to explain things better than rushing. So um, I wonder if there are any comments or questions from the people, uh, from the people that have been uh, watching the, the seminar. I got a few personally um, sent by some, some students. Let's see if there is any, anything from the, the online viewers not that I can see of. Um, okay, so um, so I I have a question about the, I don't know, Elena. Do you have any question? Otherwise, I start with the ones I have. Oh, no, please go on. Okay, so um, you mentioned a few times that there was a discrepancy between between your uh, estimate of speed of the sailfish if compared to the old 1941 estimate. Yeah. I wonder in which conditions w was that estimate taken? So was it while it was chased as a prey instead of acting as a predator? Would, yeah, that, so in opinion, would that, in your opinion, change the effort 
and uh, and uh, the energy that would would have um, you know devoted to this activity by by the, by the animal. Yeah. So there's I think uh, there's not a lot that I can say about that estimate. Um, we sometimes make jokes that it was done in 1941 during the war. So <laughs> that's a little bit of a problem. But certainly, mm -hmm. without going into the details, the, the methods in this uh, uh, paper are, are not very uh, uh, well explained. And, you know, we're talking about something almost like 100 years ago. So it was done with like a stopwatch. And uh, I think the sailfish was even jumping out of the water. So it's like a, it's a completely different a story. So my my conclusion is that that is most likely an overestimate. Uh, we did our best to see, you know, how fast it can go. Uh, there is something that I haven't talked about, but it's some work by Denny Weiss and and colleagues that uh, it's it's a sort of a, um, modeling work. But uh, uh, they come up with an idea that any um, marine vertebrate that goes faster than 10 meters per second, maybe 12, would actually uh, incur into uh, cavitation damage. And so they, they uh, suggest that uh, it's unlikely that we will see uh, any dolphin or killer whale or sailfish or anything like that go faster than 10 or 12 meters per second. Uh, if someone asked me, you know, what would be a candidate, uh, my answer would be, well, I, I try swordfish you know swordfish may even be faster but again i don't know if they'd be as fast as 30 meters per second i think that's a, a little bit of an excess uh but, so but what, I don't, about the, what about the motivation thing so do you expect them to uh, to be way faster if chased rather than being the predator being the prey rather than being yeah the uh, yeah no that's a that's a good point uh you're right they they probably wouldn't have much motivation in the um um kind of uh, uh, events that we recorded because as I showed you, they have other means of, of catching the prey. I guess one potential motivation would be competition. So if, if they were competing against each other, then uh, a selfish may want to get there faster than another one. Uh, and, and, uh, and that may, may cause a faster, faster speed. Uh, they don't have very many predators. So it is possible that if we find some kind of predator chasing them, maybe they go even faster. But my point is the work we did with the muscle uh, shows or at least suggests uh, strongly that they cannot really uh, possibly go faster than that. Now, again, this work is based on a principle uh, that relates uh, contraction speed with, with uh, actual swimming speed. And this principle can be broken with some kind of overlap of, you know, the swimming muscle and uh, th there may be some possibility. So it's not like uh, last word being said, but at the same time, uh, I think there is a strong suggestion that they cannot go any faster and that any past work was simply an overestimate, probably not very precise. Okay. And uh, being related to this, um, you mentioned a few, or oh, you showed a, a graph that in which you were uh, showing the difference between the estimate with the accelerometer versus the video analysis. So, is it correct to to say that the accelerometer would be the gold standard for these kind of estimates? Well, potentially, but not necessarily, because um, there's still potential effects of having put the accelerometer on them. Oh, yeah. and, you know, we, we don't know how long it takes for recovery and all that. So, yes, accelerometer would be great, but there is always pros and cons for everything. So that's why we decided to use two methods. And uh, luckily, these two methods give similar results. So that's why we're relatively confident. And then with the third method, which was the muscle contraction, we expected to get values that were a little higher than what we observe. And that's what we did, because the muscle mm -hmm. contraction is... Uh, doesn't take into account, for example, water resistance and anything like that. So it's like, so how po how fast can they possibly go? And it turns out it seems to be 10 meters per second. So uh, with all potential uncertainties, I'd be surprised if they can go a lot faster. And I'm adding what I just said before, the, the idea 
uh, that was developed by Danny Weiss of uh, the uh, cavitational damage that does not probably allow marine vertebrates to go much faster than this. Okay, okay. And then there is an, a question from a friend, uh, a previous student of mine that worked on uh, Breeders' Whale on feeding, multi-species feeding aggregation. And she was wondering whether the, the presence of other um, predators, like birds, for example, because we have seen a few birds in your video, yeah. right? So how much that would affect the choice of a strategy, uh, not necessarily in the humpback whale, but even with the orcas or uh, in other situations in which there might be the interaction with other species that may change the configuration of the, of the school. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And it's actually a question that we're working on. And it's actually a question worth working on because there is not a lot known about this. There is all kinds of potential uh, outcomes of this. There is potential competition. There is potential advantage for both uh, species. And uh, we've encountered not only the birds in the middle, uh, but also sometimes you have sea lions coming in, you have dolphins coming in, you have tuna going through, and, uh, and, and there's no reason to believe that this would be necessarily uh, competitive interactions. Sometimes they would actually have different strategies and they would be different enough that may actually be able to help each other. And it, it is known in, in the marine realm, not necessarily in the open sea, but from many examples of species interacting to catch a prey. I mean, as a, uh, uh, the, the, the example of, for example, moray eel and, uh, and a grouper interacting to catch a prey from the tropical seas and you know, all kinds of uh, potential interactions. So uh, yes, I think it's an important question. The interaction can be there. The interaction doesn't have to be negative. In fact, in most cases, it's prob probably positive. And whether it's really a, a, a fully collaborative event or it's just an incidental advantage to both, that's something that uh, you know we need a lot more work on. Yeah, that's the problem with byproduct outcomes that you never know whether it is. Uh... Okay, so and then I have a, a couple of questions myself. I would say um, related to um, one is. Um, is about what would you expect to see in uh, other mammalian uh, species, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, otters or pinnipeds, seals, uh, that they have a different anatomy of the neck. And so the, they may have a different ability once they are close to the prey to actually move a part of the body instead of the whole body. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's... What kind of reaction would you, what kind of uh, changes would you expect? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's interesting. It depends also on where they are hunting. I mean, they can be hunting at depth, in which case, for example, they, they have a sensory system that can detect vibration with their vibrissae and, and other tools like that. Uh, having the neck, of course, helps a lot because it, it adds to the maneuverability and acceleration, as you're saying. Uh, we have some observation uh, that, that show, for example, that they they may be uh, um, more successful. Or this this is still very speculative. We don't have enough hard data, but they may be more successful in attacking fish from below rather than in the horizontal. And so they would have no no problems attacking from below. But the fish would have disadvantages in being attacked from below because their sensory system is geared to seeing things in the horizontal plane. So, and, and, and as you were mentioning, the flippers, of course, there may be also some, uh, mm -hmm. some potential advantage of that. But I have not done work directly on pinnipeds, so I shouldn't be saying too much about things that I am not an expert on. And uh, so that is uh, something, um, and then, uh, no, I probably, uh, oh yeah, the, the, the thing that, was uh, was pretty interesting for me. It was uh, a, a different in perspective because I work on terrestrial ecosystem and uh, I've seen a lot of uh, predation events on a two D <laughs> uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, surface, right? In this specific case, uh, of course, when you present your data, you tend to make it as, a, as if it is a, a, a two-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, reaction. But as a matter of fact, it's, it's a three-dimensional, and that adds a layer of complexity that may not be there when we look at uh, those kind of move, animal movements in the, in the ter terrestrial um, yeah. ecosystem. So I, I wonder if uh, when, when you think about your lines, you actually think about um, multi three-dimensional space, a plane, I guess it's way more, the geometry is way more complicated than you no, you're right. you are you are right, but uh, for the work that we've been doing so far, we've actually worked mainly in two dimensions, and that's a limitation. But in some cases, somewhat realistic. I mean, I, what I showed you in the last example, for example, of the whales, the killer whales hunting uh, in shallow water, that's that's fabulous because it oh, yeah. uh, that goes around like the that. problem. <laughs> we, yeah. They, they yeah. admittedly, they work in 2Ds, and um, yeah. uh, it was very easy to analyze. Uh, but with but the for, uh, Yeah, but I mean, you can treat that as, as, as you know, yeah, the, the okay. main reaction as, as something in, in, in 2Ds. But certainly, uh, working in 3Ds is something that we want to implement. We want to start uh, taking stereo cameras in the field. Uh, and, and these sort of things. But uh, uh, so far, we've been assuming, and in particular, taking behaviors where we knew the, the action uh, occurred particularly mainly in 2Ds. But you're right, in the open ocean, uh, the third dimension adds uh, complexity. Mm. And, uh, uh, and another consideration that I had uh, because of my experience with the canids um, the, the, it is very well known that dogs in particular perceive uh, they, they do not have an excellent sight. So they actually perceive movement by changing the dimension of the shape. Mm -hmm. For example, if you want to, to scare a very aggressive dog, you can point an umbrella towards them and then open it immediately, uh -huh. very, very abruptly, and that would mimic a very big animals coming to them very yeah. quickly so that so i guess uh, that perception of a, of a, of a change in shape is uh, is pretty common probably in the yeah. in, in the animal world yeah 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 it's uh, i think it's a common reaction and uh, it's it's also common in in us i you know I always think about uh, that projection of the train uh, one of the first uh, movies ever shown. <laughs> it's maybe perhaps a little bit of a legend, but yet a, a train coming is just by the, the brother Lumiere and uh, everybody in the audience got scared because of the train coming <laughs> towards them. Yeah. So it, it's this looming threshold idea is, is, is quite common in, 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 in a lot of different animals, including invertebrates. And it's an interesting mm -hmm. tool to predict when at least a visual reaction occurs. Now, a very important point is that um, uh, fish don't just re rely upon vision. So they would have other senses that uh, make, uh, make them escape. And in the case of the whale, for example, uh, a vision is likely to be the one, but in other cases, they may be escaping because of uh, uh, hydrodynamic senses such as the lateral line. And in most cases, it may be uh, uh, a sum of different senses that uh, together co-occur and send a signal to the brain that it's time to escape. So uh, this is it's quite a complex system and it's not always that one sensory channel that drives the, drives the reaction. Well, I guess in uh, I have I have learned a new word the other day by watching a whale documentary, and it was uh, in the murk when there is a very very uh, how do you say not uh, clean waters. I guess uh, they need some other yeah. means to detect. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I guess I don't have any other question uh, from the from people. And uh, Elena, do you have any question? Yeah, uh, I have a question that is uh, related to what uh, Alessandro 
talked about. So uh, if you think uh, uh, and uh, how much in that case do you think uh, it's important uh, the uh, uh, intensity of light uh, during the day, for example, for what you were uh, measuring in terms of so uh, velocity, acceleration, both for predator and prey. So do, do you expect uh, uh, any significant variability yeah. In this yeah. No. I, the day. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe this is a stupid question because no, 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 I have no, no. It's, a, it's a very relevant question, and it, uh, it's a question that would actually pair up with the uh, uh, turbidity. You know, the, these systems you can have more or less uh, turbidity occurring, as well as you know the 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 more predictable you know time of the day that you know predators may actually uh, sink with, and and we have actually done some experiments on cod. Uh, looking at this uh, appearing looming threshold in the same way as we did with anchovies. But that time, we didn't use a computer system. We actually used a real object going through a tank, simulating a, a predator. So it was a very long tank, like five meters long, because we actually wanted to play with the water turbidity. So we had different kinds of turbidity. And of course, as you'd expect, what we found is that in relatively high turbidity, the prey escaped only at the last minute, if at all, to the model. So, of course, it is a model. So it is possible for certain predators that have some backup systems, uh, meaning sensory system, to be actually a lot more effective in turbidity or certain times of the day. Because this reaction, this the alpha dt value that I showed you, works as it is in uh, transparent water. But if you look, if you dim the light or you increase turbidity, there will be another value and, uh, and it will be much higher. So the predators will be able to get much closer to the prey, at least considering the sensory system of vision. And therefore, the prey would probably rely upon other sensory systems, such as the lateral line. But at that point, the lateral line we know works in the near, in the near field. So it may be a bit too late for the prey to respond to an attacking predator. Um, th this, of course, does not take into account the disadvantages the predator also would have in lower light availability and lower turbidity. But if the predator can compensate, then it would be a good time to uh, go out and, and prey on, on, on little fish. And uh, just a curiosity, uh, what about uh, nocturnal? Uh, feeding activity. Do you do you know if they do the same? They simply do not feed at no, no, night. That's a, no, no, that's a it's a good question. Uh, we know uh, for the killer whales, we we know that actually herring come to the surface at night, and uh, so that would be a good time. <laughs> but they are dispersed, and we also know that killer whales don't, as far as we know, don't feed at night. They're probably too visual. To, to be able to feed at night. So what happens is the herring go down at depth during the day and the killer whales manage to dig them up, and take them to the surface so they have an easier time to, to slap them. But then at night, the killer whales just hang out, do rest probably, and, uh, and the herring come to the surface and disperse. Uh, but there is no feeding activity as far as I know. And in terms of the humpback whales or the uh, Sailfish, I don't really know. I, I suspect they wouldn't. Uh, sailfish also are very visual, just like swordfish. I mean, these, these, these guys are very visual predators. They have huge eyes. And as you may know, uh, swordfish also have uh, warmed up eyes. So they, they have a, a, a countercurrent system such that uh, manage to warm up their brain and their eye to a temperature that is higher than that of the water. And so they have a much... Uh, uh, a, a very developed and very fast uh, sensory system uh, uh, compared to you know the, the environment in which they are, which would give them an advantage compared to their prey, and and so I, I think uh, a lot of this points in the direction of of uh, these sort of feeding activity occurring during the day. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I guess Paolo. 
we don't have any more questions. I haven't received any. So um, I, I, I want really thank you for being here and having spent this time in preparing and then um, giving this talk that was very interesting also for me as a, as a researcher uh, to better know your work. And, uh, and so, and maybe we can think of something uh, together, working together. Sorry. Okay. Thanks again, and uh, we now will move to another uh, virtual room where uh, Paolo will show us some more videos that he could not share in this uh, um, uh, streaming system. Okay, so uh, Paolo, I can give you five minutes to get ready. Okay, that's good. Going to the room. <laughs> okay. thanks okay. everyone. And thanks a lot, Elena, for introducing Paolo to me. That was a was a was a very nice thing to do, and. Uh, for introducing him. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.